Hey everyone, Tim here from Snap Attack. Let's dig into this week's Threat Snapshot. So, first up we're going to talk about the ESXi ARGS ransomware. The situation around this is rapidly evolving, so by the time you're watching this video, some of the details may have changed. Last week, last Friday specifically, the ESXi ARGS ransomware was first discovered. Uh, it is affecting internet-facing ESXi servers that are running older versions of the software. Um, there is specifically a two-year-old vulnerability um, in the open SLP service, and that vulnerability allows remote code execution, and it's also unauthenticated. So uh, between those two factors and also that it's running as a privileged service, it makes it very ripe for this attack because uh, this ransomware uh, itself can um, get access to that ESX server, it can shut down the VMs, it can encrypt, encrypt those files, and then demand ransom for you know, recovery. So uh, the news article here that I wanted to highlight is that we are seeing some variations um, from the initial version, and we'll talk through some of this a little bit more in depth. Um, but they are changing the way that they do encryption because there were some flaws initially with how they were doing it that allowed the VMs to be decrypted. So let's break it down to a couple of different sections. So what is the CVE that they're using? Um, so I mentioned before, this is a two-year-old CVE. Um, there are patches available and they've been available for a while um, that are targeting this open SLP service. Um, this is a really interesting article that breaks down how the exploit works. Uh, this one is a little bit more complicated than um, a lot of the others that you would see. and. Really, again, if you're a CTF junkie or you like exploit dev and you want to understand a little bit more about how the SLP service works and how to do the heap grooming needed to actually exploit this, um, this is a very fascinating in-depth article. Um, the piece that I would just kind of like to highlight here is that, um, and again, this is very in-depth here, um, that there's actually multiple concurrent requests that have to go on um, interacting with the service. There's actually about 40 different clients that they have to actually get everything in the correct location and memory in order to do that um, heap overflow and get the remote code execution. So you'll see the steps here. You can also see that here in this POC uh, that's available. Uh, I'm going to kind of slip down to the bottom here where they're talking about all of those requests and you can see like this is client one and all of the different things that they are doing all the way up until at the end we have client 40 uh, putting that last little bit of data in there. So we're not going to dive too much more into this. It is a relatively complicated exploit, but there are POCs available. Um, this is what the attackers are using. And again, they do target some very specific versions of ESX. So easiest solution to this is patch, uh, apply the patches and make sure that you are up to date. Um, so what happens after the CV is exploited? Um, so this is, there's two parts really to this ransomware. There is this encrypt.sh and then there is a actual encryption binary. Uh, the encryption binary isn't really that interesting. It's just going to encrypt files and it takes some command line arguments. And uh, this encrypt.sh, the shell file, is also relatively uh, basic. Um, it's very easy to read, and we can just kind of go through some of the things that they're doing here. So they're going to look for all of the processes that are running VMX files. Um, those are going to be your virtual machines, and they're going to kill those. Um, once they've stopped all of the VMs, they're going to look for various file extensions, um, your VMDKs, your VMX files, your configs, your, your memory and they're going to start encrypting those files. Um, if they're relatively small files, uh, under 128 megabytes, they're going to encrypt the whole thing. Otherwise here, um, you can see in this section, they're going to encrypt uh, parts of the file. So, you know, VMs can be large when you're talking about, you know, 40 gigs, 100 gigs for a disk, maybe more. Um, that's gonna take a long time to encrypt. So a lot of times ransomware does is they encrypt random blocks. So this one might encrypt one block every 45 megabytes. And that's where they kind of got into some problems is there was a lot of the file that was unencrypted and was recoverable. So that's where we're seeing some changes um, in a later version to try and make sure that more of the key file is encrypted and also make it harder to recover. Um, obviously they changed the index.html to leave the ransom note, also setting the message of the day. So when you SSH in, it's going to tell you that you've been um, compromised. 
They're going to do a little bit more here to uh, cover their tracks, and they're also going to set up some persistence mechanisms. So they've got this uh, auto backup SH file as a persistence mechanism, and they're also turning on SSH uh, if that isn't started. So um, really interesting to just kind of read through and see what all this is doing. Again, nothing overly sophisticated here, but um, kind of novel in the fact that we haven't seen ransomware acting like this um, you know, that often. Um, obviously, because this is targeting internet-facing servers, um, whether you are a Shodan fan or a Census fan, um, all of your mass internet scanners, you can see and you can kind of track in real time um, how many infections there are, how many are still currently infected, who's vulnerable. Um, this here is searching, searching by country, so you could apply that. Um, you could also look at the organization name and see you know, who exactly is affected here. Um, so it's always interesting to kind of see um, and track this. Um, obviously, there's going to be a lot of internal facing servers that are also vulnerable to this. This is really looking for uh, organizations that have ESX servers that are on the internet that are public facing because that's what that ransomware is going to be uh, attacking. Um, how do I prevent this? How do I detect this? What is the, the mitigation guidance? So I'm going to point over to this CISA alert. Um, this covers everything in very good depth. And we'll talk about you know, some of the different details around what it's doing, uh, recovery guidance, and some mitigations. Uh, basic things that you're going to see for mitigation is, number one, review. Does this ESX server need to be on the internet? Um, chances are the answer is no. Um, don't put that on the internet. That's a very simple way to make sure that you are not going to be exploited by some of these low-hanging fruit. And if it isn't this um, CVE that's two years old, there's other CVEs that affect VMware, ESX, and vCenter um, that attackers could use. So if you aren't patching and keeping things up to date, um, you, know, you could really be leaving yourself vulnerable to this sort of attack. Um, another option that you could do is you could um, harden the service. So you could disable OpenSLP. Um, that's not likely something that is needed for um, how you're how you're using VMware, so that's one way um, to you know again work around this if a patch isn't um, something that you can apply. Uh, other ways that you could do that is setting a firewall rule um, to make sure that that open SLP service isn't exposed to the internet, um, and ultimately just making sure that you're patching your systems and keeping them up to date. I know that's a pain for ESX, especially if you're you know running something in more of a lab setting and you don't have the cluster and you have to bring down all the VMs to apply the patches and updates. Uh, been there, done that, um, but it is just super critical. So that's really the only way that you can be secure around this. Um, we talk about you know threat hunting and detection engineering a lot of times, and we do have those in Snap Attack for you know various VMware products. We have detections in place. Um, just given the speed of the ransomware here, given how that's being affected, um, this is not an effective you know, tool or mitigation. You don't see organizations installing EDRs or antivirus or things on an ESX server. Again, it's running a small uh, stripped down version of Linux, the Photon OS. So that's not something that's um, widely going to be used. And a few organizations that I've seen actually will ship off the VMware logs to a, a SIM or some other data lake where they can analyze those. So. Really, your best uh, bet is to patch these systems uh, as, you know, when vulnerabilities like this come out and make sure that they're staying up to date. If you are affected, CISA did release this um, ESXi ARGS recovery script, which you can run. And uh, if we actually take a look at this here, you know, how this works, um, this is really kind of interesting. And again, what it's taking advantage of is that there are some files that are not necessarily encrypted or not encrypted well. Um, so this is uh, actually looking for VMX with the little um, tilde, the little squiggly after. Um, so that's a, a temp file. Um, usually you see that when the VM is running and because they are force killing the VM processes and not shutting them down the correct way, um, there might actually be a copy of that VMX file that we can uh, launch and that's the config. So we can restore that config. Um, and then we can also point it to a different, um, you know, VMDK, the flat file. They can, um, again, do the VMFKS tools to validate and potentially repair some of that file if there is some corruption. Um, or at the very least, you may be able to get on the VM and pull some of the critical files and things off. So this is a recovery script. It's not you know, foolproof, and especially with some of the variations that have uh, we've been seeing that are encrypting more of the files. But 
uh, this is definitely something that if you are affected, you can check out and highly recommend that. All right, pivoting over to the next part of our threat snapshot. Um, let's talk about IIS web shells and um, specifically um, using DLLs and other modules as a backdoor. Uh, we've talked a lot in some of our snapshots about some, you know, very public IIS and, you know, related uh, exploits. So proxy shell, proxy not shell, uh, OSSRF. Um, again, a lot of those are affecting um, Outlook, OWA, but that's also running on IIS. So um, I think back in the day, if you're used to web shells, you would see your .asp files or your ASPX files that are going to be in a web root directory. Um, easy to spot, easy to kind of detect. Uh, again, thinking of things like the China Chopper web shell and other you know prevalent ones. Um, what we're seeing now is a lot stealthier uh, techniques. And this is some threat intelligence that was put out by Microsoft's Dart team. Again, they're a, a very elite group within Microsoft that's tracking a lot of uh, nation state threat actors. And they've seen an increase in malicious IIS modules as persistent backdoors. So we've talked previously about those attacks like proxy shell and OSSRF. This is one of those things that can happen afterwards. So how can they, you know, what, once they get that um, row code execution, how can they persist on these machines? And then how can they use that malicious module to do some stealthy other activities here? So this is a really good um, in-depth blog post that talks about uh, a little bit more generally how these modules work, um, some different ways that you can um, detect them and also some ways that they can evade detection. So, you know, one of the things that we've always talked about with web shells is you have the W3WP, the IIS worker process. Um, so looking for process creation events and weird things spawning from M, uh, W3WP, um, that certainly works, but um, there's, with these modules and because you are loading a DLL into W3WP, you can also then reflectively load code in. So. This is an example here that they've seen in the wild of the potato privesque, uh, you know, vulnerability or sharp hound to um, different ways that you can load those modules in. And those don't necessarily have to spawn a process underneath. So definitely create some interesting detection opportunities here. Uh, again, really good blog post. Definitely recommend checking it out. They do have some additional threat hunting and detection strategies, which we're also going to take a look at in snap attack here. So. Let's pivot over. Let's um, take a look at what this sort of thing looks like. So we've got this uh, captured threat here. This is persistence via an IIS execution uh, or ex extension backdoor. And we're going to be using this um, open source uh, you know, DLL backdoor here. So this is IIS RAID. Um, so this is a you know, little bit older module, but still does everything that we need it to do. Um, and we're going to be using the OSSRF attack uh, again, in a vulnerable IIS, you know, OA instance, and we're going to be throwing that um, attack and then using that backdoor. So let's take a look at this. Um, this is the attacker machine. Um, there's not really anything that's going to pop up on the victim machine. It's going to be relatively stealthy. So this is, again, a vulnerable exchange server. Um, we're going to throw that OSSRF exploit. And the command that we are going to be using is a PowerShell download cradle to grab that DLL and get that installed and registered to install that backdoor. So that whole process it takes a moment here. I'm going to kind of skip ahead to where we see that cluster of activity. Um, we could see there really quickly that that DLL was downloaded, or we could see that right here. And now we can hop over to interact with that um, IAS backdoor. So this is the controller module that goes along with it. Um, provide the URL, provide the password, and this is really hooking every single web request, and then we can interact with this backdoor. So I can run commands, I can do other malicious things here. Um, and again, this is that kind of stealthier way of doing this without necessarily dropping a web shell um, in the web root like you've seen. Um, lots of different detection opportunities here. We'll talk a little bit about those. So how would I detect this? How would I hunt for this? Um, obviously, we've mentioned that there are going to be parent-child relationships that you can always look at. So, you know, seeing W3WP, you know, spawning PowerShell is usually not going to be a normal activity. Um, you know, we can see here that there is that Base64 encoded PowerShell, and really this is our PowerShell download cradle to um, grab that malicious DLL and use the app command um, to register that, that module here. So those are definitely things that you can detect and you can alert on. Um, after that, 
it would be a lot stealthier. So if we wanted to uh, interact with that DLL, we can definitely reflectively load things to uh, prevent a lot more uh, process creations. This is again, a little bit more of a symptom of how the uh, OSSRF is being exploited. So that's why we have that PowerShell in here, but um, different attack variations here could certainly result in a little different chain. So can't necessarily rely on that process chain, but it's definitely something to look at. Um, what are some other detection strategies aside from the parent-child relationships? So we can look to see when there's going to be um, possible uh, IIS extensions that are being installed. Um, def definitely there's been some security research around this. And um, if you, unless you want to stick out like a sore thumb, yes, I can drop this DLL file in the temp directory or some other directory and launch that there. Um, this one is looking for really any sort of module that's going to be installed in the normal location. So the um, inet serve directory, um, this is where these would be installed on Windows. Um, obviously this is um, tongue in cheek called IAS backdoor. They're not going to be hopefully labeled quite so obvious in the real world, but um, looking for any sort of file creations in this pathway, um, especially on servers, unless you're doing some additional maintenance or installing additional functionality, you're probably not going to be seeing these um, DLLs being added. Um, so just, you know, this would be a very good thing to kind of hunt for and see, hey, across my server environment, have I seen any new DLL files that have been put in this directory? Um, that's definitely something that, that's very huntable. Um, another one thing that we can do is talk about is, um, you know, what sort of uh, processes or things are executing out of that INET server directory. So again, that's where uh, W3WP, that's it's going to be its, its current working directory. And again, we can see that here, um, you know, that that PowerShell here is running out of that directory. So that again can be somewhat suspicious, um, a little bit noisier. Um, there are definitely going to be some, you know, potentially maintenance or other things where there could be legitimate activity, but it should be quite low. Um, but definitely a different way of kind of looking at it besides just that parent-child relationship. Um, lastly, this one is probably going to be the most relevant to that way that we were loading that DLL, that native code module. Um, there are other ways that you can do this, but this is going to look at that app command install and looking specifically for us to have those parameters to install that backdoor. So you can see here um, that command line, and this is what this is matching. Um, this is definitely going to be a little bit harder to uh, do other ways. So this is a pretty reliable uh, detection, and I would definitely have that in your arsenal. So, you know, with Snap Attack, we make that easy to, you know, one-click deploy to, again, because this is a Windows event, we could deploy this to our SIM. So um, we could definitely look for those sort of things. So that's our threat snapshot for this week. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, feel free to comment below in the video, like, subscribe, and we'll see you next time.